those kind of conversations can't currently happen. Instead, people use the talk page and say, you remember this paragraph, or they just quote bits of it and hope that people have seen the talk page when they're editing the main article, which isn't necessarily a very comfortable way of doing it, and it allows us, um, gets us into a position where we shout at a lot of newbie users and say, oh, you didn't see the talk page message that we wrote three weeks ago that you didn't happen to see when you clicked edit, and so we're going to refer to you and shout at you for not following consensus. Anyway, so that's kind of the why. In terms of the what, so we developed um, a visual editor so far over a really long period. So the actual discussions about we should have a visual editor or should we started all the way back in about 2003 or 4. Um, those conversations were very up in the air of the, hmm, you know, Wikitext is kind of messy, but actually it's better than HTML, which was the alternative that we were discussing at the time. But it became a core goal for the Wikimedia Foundation, and it became actually significantly resourced when we started actual work in midway through 2011. So we've basically been working on visual editors so far for two years. Um, working on actors so far kind of hopefully underlines the point that visual editor is a continuous work in progress. It's not something that we've just suddenly done and just been now walking away. Um, a lot of visual editor is actually working out if it's possible for us to do something, if there's a way that we can provide this kind of technology, this kind of editing experience for people, uh, given some of the restrictions we have. And some of my colleagues will talk a bit much, a bit more about uh, the manner in which uh, visual editor is quite challenging and unique uh, compared to other editors out there. And finally, um, like other Wikimedia projects, we are part of an iterative system. We don't just fire and forget on our code, which also means that we don't try and build a perfect model and then release it, but we release it openly and uh, then change it based on feedback, based on data from people using it and other issues. So very quickly, uh, deployment of history. So this is when we made Visual Editor available for people to actually use in Angular. So the software has been written over the last two years. You theoretically, if you're a developer, have been able to go download it and install it on your wiki and play around with it. But that's not a very great experience. Most of us aren't developers. Most of us don't have the time, even if we have the ability to do that. So uh, we made it available on a wiki for some feedback about a year ago now. Um, me and Wiki.org uh, is very much rough and ready. This is a few things that work, most things don't work, and we'd like feedback, and that helped. And then we made it available for real edits by you know, real, normal users as an opt-in alpha, as we called it at the time, uh, from December 2012. Originally, that was um, only on the English Wikipedia. Later, we expanded it to all Wikipedias um, uh, since April and May this year. And then subsequently, by uh, all real edits for all real users, um, so an opt-out beta uh, from July this year. Initially, again, only on the English Wikipedia. We've uh, expanded it to more Wikipedia since, and we look forward to expanding it to more people as we uh, get ready for that. So that's kind of um, where I am. Uh, we'd like to uh, uh, hand over at this point to Rowan, my colleague, who's going to talk a little bit about architecture in a very athletic way. <laughs> <laughs>
a very rock and science-y thing and deserving of its own presentation, so we're not going to go into too much detail on that. But it is a, um, just very quickly, it is a server-side um, application written in Node.js that converts, uh, that parses wiki text, converts it into HTML, and then is also able to convert HTML back to wiki text. And so we have an existing um, PHP um, parser that is currently used to take the wiki text that you write in the page and render it and display it to like on the page. Um, but that only goes one way. That only takes wiki text and turns it into HTML, and that HTML is then useful for display, but useless for turning it back into wiki text. That's simply too difficult. So we have to go and build a separate parsing thing from scratch that's actually able to do um, the two-way conversion there and convert in both directions. So when you edit a page in Visual Editor, what happens is we take the weak text um, that is um, in the page and we run it through parcel and that converts it into HTML. Um, usually that conversion is cached because we have a parcel cache that we fill fairly aggressively. Um, the HTML is then loaded into Visual Editor and Visual Editor, being an HTML editor, does its thing with it and messes with it then spits the HTML back out. And that HTML then goes to the this, this second component of the parsoid um, called the serializer, which takes that HTML and turns it back into wiki text. And that wiki text is in the same as the page. So um, specifically, um, Visual Editor itself only loads when you click like the Visual Editor edit button, like the edit media button on the Wikipedia. So when you're just viewing the page, we've only just loaded enough code to put that button there and nothing else. So you've just got the link. And then when you actually click the link, you load a whole bunch more code, it loads the actual editor. Um, it then goes and asks Parsoid for the HTML and wants that page. Um, and then when we get that, um, a component called the data model um, in within the editor builds what is called a linear model, sort of a conceptual representation um, from that HTML. And that is sort of our representation of the main doc of the document that you're editing. Then there is a layer called um, content editable that is the sort of surface that actually that you're actually interacting with. That actually lets you put a cursor somewhere and like type and press backspace and do all those things. And that is based on the data model and synchronized with the model. And then we have um, what we call editing tools. There are things like the bold button and the list button that let you edit things um, other than through typing. Um, and then finally, um, the glue code between MediaWiki and uh, Visual Editor provides you a way to provides you a way to save, and that, that takes the that scoops up the data model, turns it back to HTML, um, sends that back to Parser, which turns it back into Wikitext, text, and saves the page. And so, as a diagram, it looks like this: um, we have Parser HTML that we received from Parser. Um, it is that is sort of turned into a linear model in the, in the data model. Will be the end. Um, that then interacts in two directions with the, with the rendering layer, um, because we take the data model and we render it in uh, in content editable in CD. But we also let you type there and um, and change things, and so that goes back into the data model to just change something. And then the, the various toolbar buttons and all that stuff is in the VEUI layer for user interface, and that also goes and changes the data model. Um, the shutter is designed to be a very flexible modular, and um, we've actually implemented like pretty much everything as like a plugin. So even like the very first part of the license, the paragraph or a heading, is implemented um, the same way that you would implement a plugin. Um, that makes it very easy to sort of like extend or replace existing things that were already built. Um, and you can do these things even if you are in like a user script or a gadget on the wiki. Um, you can you can write code that looks into visual editor and adds new things or replaces things. And of course, we're always looking forward to new creative ways people might come up with to expand visual editor to editing new sorts of new, new concepts of content or new uses like uh, like proofread page, for instance, which has this different editing concepts. Um, or new platforms entirely like WordPress because Visual Editor is an HTML editor. It's not tied to weak text at all. So if you wrote an equivalent of parser of WordPress, you could edit WordPress with Visual Editor, which would be awesome. So at this point, I'm um, going to hand, hand it over to Ed, who's going to talk a bit about the data model layer. And then we're going to have some other people come up and talk about sort of the bits of the system. So, um, 
Um, I'm going to talk to you about this layer called the data model, which is actually pretty key to why we have Visual Editor and how it works. Um, and one of the main questions we get asked is, you know, uh, why don't we just use an off-the-shelf HTML editor? Um, and a lot of uh, content that comes back from Wikitext would be like a, a template which renders a whole uh, table like an info box. Now, if we just let you go in and edit that table and delete whole rows, move stuff around, then uh, we wouldn't know how to convert that back into template syntax. We have to have some sort of abstract concept. So this is one template that you can select, move around, delete, and edit the parameters for. So um, we can't just edit this password in HTML we get back directly. We have to convert it into something that we can edit. <coughs> also, we have to be able to convert this, whatever we convert it into, back to HTML. Um, and we have to do it without messing a whole lot of stuff up. If you open up uh, a document and edit, say, the first word, we don't want it to then go down and clean up your HTML at the bottom because you know you didn't close the tag or whatever. Because that's going to make your edit look confusing when people review your diff. Um, the other thing this data model needs to do is synchronize with the content editor, which Ron showed in this diagram earlier. We had the, uh, the middle box, which is the data model, and then the content editor on the right. Uh, so the content editor model is, you know, you place your cursor and you start typing. When that happens, we need to update the data model so that it reflects what you've just typed. But also if you use like an editing tool, like uh, inserting a, a new list or uh, using the undo, uh, that's going to make a change directly to the data model. That needs to then update the view. You know, if you hit undo, it's got to then show you what you just undid. And what would be also really awesome is if we could support real-time collaborative editing in the future. So that's a consideration. Um, so we've used a lot of terms here. I'm just going to show you an example because I think that's usually the best way to you know, understand it. So what we get from our password is HTML, a big HTML tree. I've just given a very small example here, uh, just a single paragraph. But that'll be a, a whole HTML tree. And we completely flatten it. So your whole HTML document just becomes one long array. Um, and that lets us do things like uh, transactions, which are sort of mini bits within the document. Um, let's just do them really easily. So if you say selected the word hi and typed in X, you can just say, okay, move forward one, uh, remove H, I, insert X. And that becomes like a mini diff in your transaction history. You can undo that and redo that. And uh, you can uh, also serialize it, send it over the wire, and uh, do collaborative editing. So the data model is not actually that complicated, but it's hugely important for our present functionality and our future functionality. Um, there's also a whole bunch of other issues involved with uh, how we're going to store sort of complex text in our data model, uh, sort of other languages, East Asian languages. And I'm going to hand over to David, who is a very small expert in this field, and he's going to tell you all about it, and your minds are going to build. <laughs> different about language support from general software engineering? Well, different languages are profoundly different. So you can have a situation where um, a piece of software is quite mature, has a lot of users, works very well, and then you throw in one character from a different script and bang. Um, I had a good example myself. I have a UK bank account. Um, I made a bank transfer. I typed in a Cantonese character in the bank transfer. It was one of these special ones for a reason I'll explain later. When I received my bank statement at the end of the month, the text just stopped. To the point the was. The second half of my bank statement was completely blank. <laughs> so this, this is in a, a banking environment. So you see, um, uh, we're going to go back to this theme again and again. The language support in the different languages is really difficult. Um, so, um, as we see before, the data model supports um, uh, characters by storing them as an array of, um, of, of letters. But what exactly is a letter? Okay, so in JavaScript, a letter, a, a string is an array of characters, but these characters are unicode code points. Now, 
that is not always the same thing as what appears to be a character on the screen, what you can cursor over with one cursor plus. Um, a logical character is called a graphene cluster, and a graphene cluster can be made up of a number of Unicode characters. Um, so let me give you an example. So if, if you have this example here, we have an N circumflex and then a G. So in JavaScript terms, um, that's actually stored as a string of three JavaScript characters at the end. The combining circumflex, which here is highlighted in red, and the G. Okay, so if we, ha if we have this array of three characters, that doesn't match the user experience because the user um, in the browser will cursor over only two characters. So a more um, logical um, representation has the N in the circumflex as a single unit, because that's how it works with cursoring, and then the G as a, a single unit, so you have a, a, a string of length two. And there's a Unicode specification for how all this works with different scripts, and it's called um, uh, TR29, Technical Reports 29. And so we spent a, a good deal of time coding this all up so that our system works correctly according to TR29. Um, and then we found that <laughs> this doesn't work at all. <laughs> um, the reason it doesn't work is because browsers do not necessarily follow TR29. So in some cases they don't follow it because the, the browser support for a particular language is, is uh, incomplete. Um, in other cases it, it's because um, they've um, provided some custom support for a particular language. Um, so you see there's a common theme here. We, have, we had um, a design that seemed to work very well. You know, we tested it in sort of eight major scripts. Um, everything seemed to be going swimmingly. And then we get a bug report in from somebody. Hi, I'm using an Indic language and this doesn't work. Um, in language support, you get a lot of this. And it's really important to us to hear back from as many of you as possible about your experiences with your script in Visual Editor. Because no matter how well we test, if we're not using your language, if no one's giving us feedback about your language, it's not getting tested. Um, and sometimes we might have to completely redesign um, when such a bug report comes in. Okay, but we shouldn't feel too disheartened if, if Visual Editor sometimes has um, problems in certain scripts. Um, I was going to show you a slide showing you a number of different uh, script problems. Um, however, when I put it into the presentation package, um, the application crashed. So instead of this slide, here is a screenshot of the slide as it, as it would have been, um, and the crash report just keeping it. Um, so I, I hope that's still big enough to see. Okay, so, we, so th these are just five different examples of um, uh, things you might want to try at home to crush uh, our software or somebody else's. Okay, number one is sub supplementary characters. So here you can see the Cantonese character uh, for elevator or lift. Um, this is um, unusual, but not that unusual, in that it's made up of two Unicode code points. Um, so two Unicode code units, I should say. Um, the vast majority of characters um, are actually of this form, but the the vast majority by usage are made up of one code unit. So a lot of software assumes that a code unit is the same thing as a character. Put this character in, and like my bank statement, it might go bang. Um, the second one is complex graphene clusters. So this is, this is an Indic script um, called uh, Malayalam. Um, it's uh, a language spoken by about 50 million people, so uh, you know, numerically fairly important, but um, the the text you can see on the second line here is five Unicode code points, um, but it's rendered here as a single cluster, a single character. So if I put my cursor on one side, I can jump over it in one bound, like Superman. Um, however, if I change the font in a different font, it may be two logical characters. So changing the font can change the number of logical characters. This was something we didn't know until we got a bug report uh, saying, guys, you're going to have to completely redo this. It doesn't work in Indic languages. OK. Um, number three is combining accents. You can see we have a C with a circumflex and with a grav accent. If your language uses some um, fairly unusual accents um, or on accents on fairly unusual letters, then there may not be a single 
letter in Unicode that does what you want. So you may have to take the letter C and add a combining graph accent and a combining circumflex and so on until you get uh, to what you want. So this again is three um, logical uni Unicode code points, but it's one character um, in the browser. Then we get onto the difficulty of uh, bidirectional text. Okay, who here um, speaks Arabic or Hebrew? Yes, okay, so you'll be familiar with this already. Okay, um, if, you, if you have a, this text here in Hebrew, it's written from right to left, okay? But then you put in the, uh, the numbers in the ASCII numerals, then that's from left to right. The, your, your browser cursor will get extremely confused as you cursor um, between left and right. Is it supposed to go in the logical direction of the text, or is it supposed to visually follow the cursor direction? And browsers don't agree on this, and um, so we have to we have to cover all these issues. Um, we are aided there because people that use right to left scripts are used to software being absolutely pathetic at handling it. So, um, uh, for example, if you insert your cursor between the, the the digits and the Hebrew letters, and you press space, um, the space may jump to the end of the text, um, or it may jump to the other end of the text. And in general, the user has no idea. Um, uh, which is going to happen. Okay, and then you have input methods, which is um, sort of predictive text for typing in Asian languages. Um, and they create a whole bunch of problems because not only do you have to worry about the operating system and the browser, you also have to worry about the input method software. So it just takes the number of different varieties you have to test for and multiplies it by about 10. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, all these, all these different issues create um, constraints and we have to code the system to fit in with uh, all these different constraints at the same time. Um, but fundamentally we need your feedback so please test in your scripts, in your language, please tell us what doesn't work so that we can uh, go about making your life less of a misery. Okay, um, I'm now going to hand over to Ines who's going to talk a little bit about the contents editable. Thank you. Is 
just the HTML attribute that we can apply to pretty much any element, and it makes it editable with uh, keeping the same exactly rendering. So that let, let us achieve the goal of uh, visibility. So the user gets exactly the same uh, the same view in the edit mode as, as we get in the view mode. So let me now talk to you about how we how we are solving the inconsistency in the which I have. Uh, so in order to we don't have that problem, we implement a program for sort of handling. Uh, so we don't rely on a, on a browser uh, native uh, functionality of moving cursor to the right place. Uh, we basically stop browser from doing what browser with native will do, and we figure out in, uh, in JavaScript where the cursor should go. So in this by doing it that way, we are, we are totally in independent. Um, also, it prevents uh, the cursor from entering protected elements. And that's a, that's a big thing in uh, Visual Editor for uh, the Media Wiki. Because we have uh, templates, uh, we have the images, we have captions. And those are elements which, uh, which contain the text. But we don't want the user to edit directly that text. We want the user to edit parameters of the template, not the, not the rendering, not the output of the template. Uh, and the same exact reason applies to, to images. Also, we, because of the handle the program, we can, we can skip our survey nodes. So we can, uh, instead of cursor going to inside a caption of the image, we can place the cursor before the image, after image, but not, not inside. So the user cannot, cannot modify the, the parts we don't want uh, the user to modify. And, um, and basically all the interactions are more predictable because we control them, uh, not the browser. So we, we can, we can program, uh, program what's going to happen to the certain interaction, and we can also handle all sorts of different, uh, different edge cases. And now I will talk about a different mechanism we have in the, in the editor, which is Surface Observer. Uh, this is a very important part when it comes to synchronizing the, the model, the data model, and our view, so the content editable. So uh, when I was talking about the good parts of the content on the table, so the text insertion, uh, we want to carry over the text insertion from the view back to the model. And that's that what Surface Observer does. It, it, it looks for the changes in the view, and when there's a change, it fires an event that model is listening to, and notifies model about that change. And mo model figures out exactly what got added or removed in, in what part of the document. And this way, we always stay, uh, stay in sync. There's an interesting thing about uh, uh, supporting input method editors. So that's the way of uh, entering text in like uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean languages and others. That's about a browser comp composition start and composition end events. Um, this, is, this is the time between which we disable service observer. So uh, when the composition of, of entering some uh, IME content starts, we disable service observer. So that content, uh, before it's fully entered, is not synced to the model. So that's something that is going to be useful for us uh, in the future uh, when we're going to have a collaborative editing, because we're going to transfer uh, transfer data to the other user when it's fully entered. We're not going to transfer uh, partial data. And Surface Observer solves a lot of problems for us, but at the same time, uh, we are thinking of replacing it with the mutation observers, uh, which, which will, which will help us because service of server is very asynchronous solution. It actually every 200 milliseconds it pulls uh, changes from the document. It, it is uh, not uh, not very uh, performant. <coughs> Versus mutation observer would be uh, the solution in which a browser notifies about the change and we just uh, read like to we check uh, what change. So uh, that part of the content editable covers all these simple interactions uh, with the the document, basically editing, editing a text, adding a text. But there are all sorts of different elements, uh, like the templates and the images. And that's something that Kimo is going to talk about. Italic, 
applications have extra parameters, not just on and off, but they'll actually have certain attributes. So in terms of links, uh, they'll have the link target. And for this, we use what we call an inspector. An inspector is a small editor that shows up in the document, and you can make a change to it and then apply it, and then we render it back to the content editor. Uh, for more complex nodes, such as generated content, this will include references, templates, metadata, and media items. And this, case, this is the case where the editor is really unique. Um, as we did discuss previously, So as Ines uh, discussed previously, um, it's very important that the user doesn't get into what we call a protected node. Um, so when we render a template and it right, renders some labels, they shouldn't be able to change the labels because those are part of the template, they're not part of our actual document. So it's a very um, generic kind of interface that we allow for to protect a node and then have a special interface to it, um, which we call dialogues. So I'll be getting into those in just a second. So the current and future tools that we have is bold, italic, links, lists, in and out dental lists. Um, those currently work and are uh, live. Uh, so each of those um, is what we call an editing tool. You can turn it off and off, and some of these have an inspector to just link to edit certain attributes. The ones that we're currently working on are um, language, so we can change um, what language the certain text is rendered in, uh, which is very important for like right to left languages as well as for accessibility reasons uh, for the code for readers of the articles. Um, underlined strike through, superscript, and in out in, out in paragraphs. So for dialogues, there's a lot of different types of generative content that we need to edit through a dialogue. So in, in those cases, we'll actually like dim the edit surface and give you a dialogue to a dedicated um, interface to edit this particular part of the document. Um, so in transcription editing, We'll open the template, especially to what we call template data, which has been rolled out recently and um, getting more traction. So I also encourage you to uh, look into that if you're doing a lot of template editing to make it easier for you to edit your template and use your template um, with these template data. Uh, references, references to list editing. So we've also recently implemented um, a feature of course, the, the citation extension where uh, references have a certain name and being reused. Uh, previously, that was a little buggy and that now works as expected. Uh, references list, there can be more than one list in an article. So all these lovely little features. Um, and of course, page settings. Uh, this is anything that's not rendered directly in the article, but is part of the wiki text. So this is categories, default sort keys, language links, and things like that. We extract those out of the visual uh, visualization in the service and give you a dedicated dialog to edit those. Uh, and thanks to parsode and serialization and partial decision serialization, those will remain in the same part of the document, so we don't pull them out and put them at the bottom unless you actually change them. Uh, media insertion and settings, we now have um, uh, searching for comments and the local and the remote wikis. Um, and the ones that are coming up soon are uh, syntax highlighter, so you can have an inline editor for code examples. Um, for syntax highlighting even in the editor itself, not just when you save it, very important. Uh, math, so this will be using math checks and uh, latex and things like that, which is very important. Um, hieroglyphs and last but not least, tables. We already have limited support for uh, tables, but this will actually allow you to do more sophisticated editing of tables. So in all of this, usability is very important. Um, editing tools are a critical component to visual editor. Um, <coughs> we're continuously iterating over these still, so there will be lots of changes and more improvements. Uh, especially in like the area of template uh, editing. Right now it's a um, very basic interface to allow you to do as much as possible because there are so many different things that can be done in Wikitext. And we'll be trying to optimize this for, for like, more common cases to make it easier to insert simple templates without having to load every single thing you can possibly do to a template. Um, which there's a lot of things there. And online Wikitext, there's actually an opportunity here for, for uh, discoverability. Like for example, if you're editing an article and you've never edited it before, you might not know what certain things mean or to how to insert new things that aren't there already. Um, whereas if you have a toolbar and editing tools, um, you can see, well, these are the options. What, what can I do to this article and what are the options? So there's discoverability and like automatic learning for like, how these things work without having to read the whole manual. Um, we'll provide full functionality but still push certain norms. And we try to be uh, have a balance between ease of use and consistency. So like I said earlier, like in the 
transcription dialogue, it's important that all the dialogues work similar, but it's also important that they're optimized for the task you're trying to do and not just for the sake of consistency and make everything look the same. Um, so with all that said, um, I'm going to hand it over to James for our future steps. Okay, so this is a very, very brief mention of the word future, because of course visual editor isn't something static that's done, it's actually coming along. So very quickly, um, our primary focus right now is stability. Um, stability in terms of getting rid of bugs, but also performance and usability, so that things that are too slow will get faster, things that um, uh, are confusing or the wrong way around or that don't make it obvious as to how you can do the right thing, uh, fixing those. There's also, as we've touched on quite a bit, language features. So IME, input uh, editing, but also language variants, uh, things like section markup. Um, uh, very important uh, to support as many wikis as possible. Because one thing we don't want to do is to get a year down the track and then say, congratulations, we've now got it available in Chinese, and then find that we have to delete everything and start again. again. Um, then, obviously, editing the things that you can't currently edit, that's galleries, that's tables, that's uh, citation, uh, formulae, that, and things like that. Um, making those available uh, is obviously a priority, so that you can edit everything rather than just the things they currently can. And then, um, expanding use of visual editor across things. Right now, visual editor is only really available on the desktop. It doesn't work incredibly well on iPad or tablet or on phone. And one of the things we want to do is make that better, working with colleagues in mobile. Uh, also working as part of the flow, other areas which are pulling in new kinds of editing, we want to um, make visual editor work for those people. And third parties, so if you want to um, build your own uh, use of the visual editor on your own wiki or in your own product, we want to make that possible. Anyway, um, the next slide says questions, but we don't actually have time for questions. So instead, we're going to do questions at the end, merged with Wikia's talk. And instead, I'm just going to very quickly demonstrate uh, this slide in which the, brow the keynote will now crash, apparently, by doing that or that. That was the keynote crashing. Sorry. Thank you, everyone.